Welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur call sign is W2LIE. And guess what? Yeah, I've got a cold. I don't sound good today, but I'm recording this anyway because, hey, stuff's got to get done. So let's just jump right into this week's podcast. Welcome to the Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Okay, welcome back to Scanner School. Everything we talk about on today's podcast can be found on our website at scannerschool.com slash session95. Today, we are talking about simulcast and how to really overcome it in a real-life situation here. Now, we talked about simulcast back on session number 18 of the podcast, which is over at scannerschool.com slash session18. But today, I'm joined by Nathan McMullen. Now, Nathan is our first ever repeat interview on the podcast so he is the very first person to come back to the podcast twice which is awesome and amazing so if you haven't caught nathan's very first interview with us it was how to scan on a budget and you can go back and listen to that one at scannerschool.com slash session 73 and we talked about nathan's his background and also his current setup where he uses older radios and uses sdr receivers in order to listen to what it is that he wants to hear. So he's been kind of tweaking that setup right now, and he's going to go over how he is dealing with simulcast. So again, I apologize right now for the way my voice sounds, but I also apologize for the way that the interview sounds because I was listening on my earbuds or my earbuds or whatever Apple calls them. Didn't realize that was also the microphone. <laughs> so it sounds a little bit different than normal. It's not through my normal microphone that you are going to be listening to me on. And I also interviewed Nathan over the phone. So that also changes the quality of the interview as well. But really good stuff. So stick with it and we'll catch you on the other side of the interview. Nathan, welcome back to the podcast. I wanted to say, I think off the top of my head here, you're our first repeat guest on the podcast. So uh, congratulations to that. And thanks for coming back onto uh, Scanner School. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you bringing me back. So if anybody didn't catch the first podcast that you were on, and that one was how to get into scanning or how to be into scanning on a budget, why don't you reintroduce yourself to anybody who might have missed that one or somebody who's coming into late to the podcast? All right. If anybody didn't hear the last one, my name is Nathan McMullen. I'm an aviation major at Eastern Kentucky University. Okay. And basically on that last podcast, we talked about you know how to get into scanning on a budget, how to you use basically SDRs, you used older scanners, but using the SDRs, you were able to kind of build things up into a way where they were basically comparable to like the SDS-100, the SDS-200, just by using some $35 dongles and some software that's easily available and a laptop, and you were, you were kind of building your own things there. So just out of curiosity, though, I mean, you're back. So I know you're building on, on that whole thing. So... Let's let's talk about what what you what you emailed me about here. So what you basically did was you went to the Scanner School website and you clicked on podcast and be a guest and you filled out the calendar, and basically you were talking about how to work around simulcast. So what is it that that you're doing now to kind of on obviously you're still on your budget. What is it you're you're doing to kind of combat the issues of simulcast in your area? So a little bit of background behind that. After I was on the last podcast, um, I was in a dorm room. I moved to an apartment now. I was able to purchase a Whistler 1040, so I was able to go portable with P25 simulcast trunking stuff. And I ran into the issue. I thought, you know, being in an apartment, being at a lower level, because my dorm, I was on the fifth floor. I thought, you know, maybe simulcast distortion or issue would not be as much of a problem. But I um, was quickly mistaken to figure out how apparent our simulcast issue is in our county. So I am using SDR trunk. But I want to make it portable. So um, I did figure out with a few programs and a few pieces of software to stream it to my phone. Nice. Kind of as a uh, walkie-talkie with Zello type of deal. Okay. So you're so then you're using Zello basically then to stream it to your phone? Is that what you're doing or are you using something different? Yes. Yeah, so um, I use the VB audio cable like some people use with the, um, the uh, SDR software. Mm-hmm. And instead of using it with the SD, you know, trunker, not you, trunker, excuse me, SDR trunk does it all for you. So I went on ahead and just under the stereo output on SDR trunk, put it on the VB audio cable, a virtual audio cable, and then went into Zello, created a separate account for my scanner, and then 
set the audio output to that um, VB audio cable, and then I created a channel on Zello. And Broadcastify is delayed. I, I do have a stream for our county on Broadcastify, but I like to have, I'm kind of like one of those nitpicky people who like to have everything not delayed. So Zello is like a two second delay. So I decided to do it that way. And another reason why I did Zello was because if you have the channel turned on or you're in busy mode, you can actually record. It automatically saves all of the transmissions in your history. Nice. So that's that's actually pretty cool. So you can actually go back then and, and play that back, whatever you've missed. So what is it that you're streaming? I guess you're streaming based on what you were saying, AP25, Summercast system. So you're doing your public safety or, or that's what you're, uh, you're streaming right now? Yeah, public safety. Our police departments are encrypted, but for some reason there's a few of our um, people in the county that are unencrypted and we get bits and pieces of radio traffic in and out, but it's mostly for fire and EMS. Okay. Perfect. So again, Zillow is free, right? So there's no cost to build the account. VB audio cable, that's free. You're using SDR trunk again, that's free. So I can still see how you're how you're sitting under the budget. So basically what you're doing is you have a setup at home that you're streaming to the internet, also to either via broadcastify or to Trello and no, I'm sorry, Zillow. And from Zillow, you're listening to it on your phone using the Zillow app. So there's no real manipulation of where the SDR is. You're not able to remote control the SDR. You're strictly just in a slave mode where you're just listening to a live stream from what's over is coming over the uh, the trunk system. Correct. Nice. So how long did it take to you to actually put something like this together? Um, as I mentioned in the same with the budget, it took me probably a day to get the SDR trunk set up. But I actually the Zell idea came to me probably a couple months after we recorded that podcast. And um, I saw a video where somebody did a, a, a link. Like an, it's, People use Zello for amateur radio with their radios to commute back and forth. I thought about doing it with SDR trunk, and it's worked really good. The only downside is, is again, it's internet connection, and if you don't have connection, you won't be able to receive anything. Right, right. And I know if you go into Zello, too, you can actually find streams from all over the place. I know I've talked about this. This is actually a video that was requested of me to do on YouTube, which I have in my, my to-do list is to how to build a, a Trello. I'm sorry, I keep saying Trello, a Zillow setup. So there'll be a YouTube video on doing it. I'm sure there's other videos out there on how to do it, but uh, I am working. It is in my schedule to have something like this set up on the YouTube channel. But, you know, there's, there's, if you go into the, to the Zillow directory, you'll find scanners all over the place. So it's, it is like, a, like one of these untapped resources where if you can't find something on Broadcastify, like you say, if you're looking for something that is a little bit more immediate than the, than the delay, there's a lot of stuff out there. In fact, I even talked about it, too, with, with Chris Gilmore on our prepping podcast when we just survived the storms, how he's also using Zillow as well. Now, it's Zillow, right? Zillow? Zillow. Zillow. Yeah, Zillow. 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 Yeah, that's <laughs> what it is. It, it's just something <laughs> Trello is a project management board. Zillow is what I use for all that real estate stuff when I look at people's houses to see what it's worth. And Zillow, or Zillow, <laughs> they're getting too close. The one that's not about how to find a house is, is the one we're looking for. It's actually, it's a PTT app. And it's pretty cool because when I mean, you're using it to, to stream a radio, right? But many mm-hmm. other people use it just as a push to talk app where they're basically it's a walkie talkie. So somebody figured out a way to run on a, on a computer, a Windows computer, and have it actually be that as like the base station part of the HT. And then that would be it. So pretty cool. So you're using your Whistler 1080. Congratulations, by the way, on the new purchase. How well is that working out for you on your simulcast system? Okay. So the 1040, so I have a monitor, two simulcasts, one at, one at my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, and in Richmond, Kentucky, where I'm in college right now right now in more in my geographic location i have one of site with two simulcast towers which makes it very difficult to actually get decode health up into higher numbers but at home luckily all the simulcast towers i live in the far eastern part of the county in louisville so i'm able to get that with no issue okay. but i always have to when it comes to doing simulcast with a non like doing simulcast scanning with a non-simulcast radio, you do need to find, I call it, a lot of people probably said this, this is called the sweet spot. you got to have to, like, move your radio around. Like, right now my radio is sitting on my desk probably about 10 feet away from me, and it can decode it 100% perfectly, no issues at all. But if I move it probably even four or five inches to the right or the left, it'll just, it won't even work at all. Yep. 
That's the problem with Summercast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so besides moving the radio around, what what are you using or what are you doing to kind of work through your Summercast headaches? I have tried. I did. There is a wiki link to. I've looked on that stuff about how to counteract simulcast distortion. I've tried the attenuator, which helps a little bit, but not a lot. Now, I know some of the other radios, you can manually set the attenuator, but on the 1040, it automatically set to negative 20 decibels automatically. So I've had some help with that, but not a lot. And then for antennas, some people have those, I think they're called Yagi directionals. I'm not sure if that's what they're called. Yeah, the Yagi antennas, yep. I've not used one personally. I don't have one. A lot of people have been saying to use that. I usually, I just try and find older, I just, I have like a ton of antennas in my drawer and I keep trying to fidget around, find one. I usually use ones that are out of band. So I have right now, I have an airband antenna on my scanner and that actually works very well, surprisingly. Right. Because if you're looking at receiving 800 megahertz and using an airband antenna, it's not really a a great match from one to the other. So that would, um, that would be one way of doing it. Have you ever tried sticking just a paper clip in the middle of, of the I have uh, not. BNC? Yeah, see if that works for you. Because when we used to do radio directional finding, RDF, what we would do is first you start off with a regular antenna and you try and hone in on where, you know, as you walk around, the signal kind of gets stronger or weaker and you can kind of figure out where that is. Then as you get really close to the signal, what you would do is you'd either attenuate the radio or you take off your antenna. And if you took off the antenna and the signal went away completely, then, okay, you know, you're still too far away to be on top of the person. But if you threw, like, a paper clip in there, and you unfold that metal paper clip just so it's that one, you know, you got the, it, it just kind of has, like, uh, you pull that one loop off of it. And mm-hmm. that sometimes is enough just to bring in enough signal that you can kind of still, like, hone in on the person. So it's an old trick we used to do when it comes to finding, you know, jammers or interference or something like that. But I haven't really played around with it yet over here because I have a couple of radios here that, you know, don't do semicasts, and I'm trying to play around them in a simulcast area but that's one of those things that's been in the back of my mind to uh, to try and do just to see if that would help out because again like you said the whole point of simulcast is to get rid of the other towers right you just want to pick up just right. the the best signal to you not even the strongest signal but the one that's coming in the clearest so that's the name of the game and it's kind of like one of these you have to think you know backwards about it because your whole life and your whole you know scanner radio career basically you're trying to bring in the most mass signals you want the best antenna the best coax the best height and, you know now all of a sudden it's like no you don't want any of that <laughs> so it's kind of like retraining yourself <laughs> yeah. on on how to get into scanning so um what else have you tried try to do with the simulcast stuff now the antennas right now uh, my antenna i uh, the airband is a uh, came off a of vertex standard airband radio and it's an sna female adapter I had to get an adapter for it to BNC. Honestly, I have, and it's worked sometimes. I would um, take the antenna off and just leave the uh, converter, the SMA to BNC, and it actually worked a little bit as well. It didn't, in some parts of the house it works, and in other parts it doesn't because it loses the signal. But, again, as you said, sometimes less is better. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's definitely a little bit backwards in that one. So besides using the, I thought you had a 1080, so instead of using the 1040, and uh, your SDRs, I mean, are you playing around with anything else right now to try and get through the simulcast? Or is this, I mean, does this work well enough for you right now where you're, you're kind of happy and, and you're able to pick up what it is you want to pick up? I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm not going to be happy until it works 100% of the time. <laughs> but um, uh, I have been dealing with the airband. There is some minor decode rate issues. I've been dealing with it. I'm trying to think of something better. I've done a lot of things. I've taken, they have... Um, yeah, where you can hook a BNC to one end. It's like, like an extender. It's like a cable where you can, you know, put your antenna on top of the roof or something. I've tried just the cord itself. That's worked too. Okay. But everything, the way my ge- geographic location, as I said before, was built, there's two simulcast towers I can basically in line of sight. So it's kind of, you got to play around with it a little bit in, in different areas. And for me, it's kind of a, game of chance because some days I'll have the scanner in the same spot and it was doing great. And the next day it's not doing so well with the same setup and everything. Right. And what, what really is, is something to keep in the back of your mind too, which I know you're probably not going to want to, uh, to hear is even though sometimes you think you're getting a good decode when that scanner goes to go to the voice channel to try and listen to something, it gets all goofy when it goes to the voice channel and can't put the bits and pieces back together again on the voice channel. So it goes right back to the, 
control channel sits there and waits. So unless you're actually looking at that scanner and you see it trying to do something, you'll think you're not missing any conversations. When in reality, it could be that scanner is just, you know, it might be get a good decode rate on the control channel, but when it goes to go to the voice channel, eh, you know. So there is right. there is that option, you know, that that issue on that I, as well. I've had that issue many times. The decode rate was 99% one time. I was sitting down watching TV in my living room, and it was 99%. And the good thing about the 1040 is that you can set, I know a lot of the newer scanners have it, the light with, you know, you can set great, uh, mm-hmm. red free yeah. MS and fire and for police blue. That way, every time, even if it pops on for a split second, I can see that light. And then if, you know, I don't see it getting a good decoder rate, I go on ahead and just kind of either reposition it or I might just bring out my phone put it on Zello. The only downside to when I'm testing it, I usually just test it for normal traffic. But if there's a fire department comes on because, you know, our county, the fire department's probably called an average three times a day. And, you know, I want to hear it because it's not very often. Usually if I see it on my radio, I have to switch to Zello if I'm not getting a good decode rate on the 1040. Gotcha. So you, so your fire department is also on the trunk system as well. So that, that's kind of a problem. Have you ever tried, like, laying the radio down on its side and changing the polarity of the antenna and then just swinging the radio around, you know, on that plane to just see if you get a better decode? I'm not. I've tried that a few times, but I never really looked into it. That it might actually be a good idea. Yeah, because what ends up happening right now is, you know, when your antenna is up and down, right? That's vertically polarized, and mm-hmm. when it comes to radios, right, everything pretty much is is vertically polarized when it comes to uh, the VHF UHF 800 spectrum. Laying the radio down on the side, though, you're changing the polarity of your receive antenna. So I believe it knocks it down. It's it's definitely a couple of dB. I forget the actual number, but for some reason twenty sticks in it sticks in my head. But I could be completely wrong. But it's it's enough of, and I think twenty just way wrong. But it is definitely enough where you where you change the polarity that you could really completely knock something out. So that might be something for you to check out as well. So even you know if it's just on your desk and you just lay the radio on its side and just see what happens. You know, I mean, right now what do you got to lose? <laughs> so. I uh, know. I mean, yeah, there's nothing much to lose. Right. The only, right. Now, I did try a shorter antenna, um, mm-hmm. Wish website. It's a Diamond SRH 8050S. It's a really yes. stubby yep, antenna. Yep, I got one of those. I bought that for, which I got it for three bucks. And I tried that. It mm-hmm. it does work a little bit. I thought, you know, maybe if the antenna was shorter or smaller, it may help that a little bit. It did a little bit, but not. Not a, not too much. Yeah, you might have to check that antenna out because it, it may not be there may not be any gain on antenna, but maybe there might be some gain on eight hundred. You gotta check that out as well, just to see where it is. But you know, it's it is definitely a game and it's part of the hobby. Now, besides doing SDR trunk, have you tried other pieces of software for the SDR? Maybe like the SD plus or or something else. I have. I've. There is, I know you can do with DSC Plus, you can set it up with Fastlane. I have looked into that. You can mm. set up that kind of stuff. I never got into it because when I did it with Unitrunker, as I said before, I was having a lot of simulcast error issues. Right. So. But you're, um, it's a, it's so DSD Plus should be able to handle this all for you now. So you wouldn't be any need to even bring in Unitrunker. So you can completely eliminate that from the, uh, from the equation. So, um, you know, it's something else to look at too. You can keep that all internal at that point, and then uh, uh, it's really cool because with with, uh, with DSD Plus too, if you have two uh, channels on the same physical frequency, you'll get a left channel and a right channel off that. So you'll be able to pick out the left and right, which is really cool. So, mm-hmm. and another thing, I looked on the. I know I'm, gonna, I'm trying not to be trying to be specific to the 1040, but I had to went to adjust some settings inside the 1040. With the control channels, one one was digital AGC. Yep. The uh, wiki told me to do that, and I've had mixed with that. It it does work a lot easier. The only problem is like one, you know, you have to compensate for you know one transmission is very quiet, the other one's very loud, but it has worked a little bit. And then I did look into Whistler forums for DSP for the mm-hmm. super the super track kind of stuff. They don't have any updates for the 1040, unfortunately, but definitely I did keep SuperTrack on. I did fiddle with SuperTrack on and off, and definitely as I kept it on, that is what's helped the most. Gotcha. Yeah, because there is, you know, there's, I was just going to get into that too. There's, so you have your DSP setting, you have your DAC 
and your ADC also. So I guess that's what's what you're not be able to get with your uh, without the upgrade on there. But I know sometimes if you change those values too, because you basically you're changing the input level of the digital and then changing it back to analog. But you know it, it is because it is simulcast. I mean the root problem here is basically the the the, the the zeros and ones coming in, right? So unless mm -hmm. you can really isolate the problem coming into the antenna and into the front end of the radio, you're really not going to be able to do too much at putting it back together again. And that's really what the IQ is in, in like the SDS 100 to 200, the unication product, is that it knows that there's supposed to be two values coming in and, you know, this is where they kind of belong in the quadrant and, and everything else. So it, it knows to look for uh, the dual path that's coming in. So that's why they call it the I and the Q. The older scanners, they just don't do it. They, they they weren't sophisticated enough to have to look for that. And it's just with anything else, right? It's just the radio just progresses into a point where it just needs to keep growing and growing and growing. So I mean, back in the day, it was just Motorola trunk systems, and it was just, you know, you couldn't mix it with conventional. Then eventually you could mix it with conventional, and you can do this RA and EDAX and LTR and, you know, now P25 on it. So it's the natural progression of, of scanning is the ability now to bring in the I and the Q. So, I mean, unfortunately, we're still at the very infancy stages of that where the price points are extremely high on those radios. But over the course, as these radios get a little bit older in age, you know, I mean, the, the, the 536, when that came out, that was that was a $600 receiver, you know. So it was up there. Now you can find them, you know, a lot cheaper than that. So the other thing I'm doing to cope with simulcast is. I take, it's horrible. I take that thing, goodness, probably almost everywhere I go, almost except going to class because you know I don't want to don't want to make my teacher mad. But um, when it comes to that, I kind of like to you know I'm going to campus or going to the airport or something. I like to figure out where where it doesn't do so well and where it does, so that way mm. I can have a mental picture in my head where if I'm taking it out somewhere, I know it's going to do fine or. I just need to leave leave it behind at home and just have Zello on standby if I need it. Gotcha. That's a pretty good. That's that's pretty good. So, have you ever looked at if you go in the radio references database and you click on the actual frequency? I'm sorry, the call sign for that trunk system. It should bring up a, a list or, or a geographical map of all the tower locations. You could probably bring that into something that's got a tuple map on it. You can find out where a little bit of ridges and valleys are. That might actually help you out to uh, to fine tune where you could actually receive it to and from. So I don't know if you ever jumped on there and even see where the transmitters were located, but that might help yeah, you as I, well. I am. Um, I'm actually looking at it right now. I've looked at it a few times. There's two different site licenses for our um, system in Madison County, and one of the site ones is just – I live just right off the highway, um, 75. There's one at the uh, communications at the 911 dispatch area. There's a t main tower there, and then just south going south down the highway, there's another one. So I'm kind of sandwiched in between the two right now. Yeah, it definitely doesn't help you out at all. No favors there. <laughs> and so then, you know, um, yeah. Our, yeah, again, as I said, there's nothing much to listen to in our county. Everything is on the simulcast. I mean, we do have state police. That is um, our post is right down the uh, – we have a bypass that goes right down the city of Richmond or in and around the city of Richmond. And that's – that and other counties around me have conventional stuff that's – Sometimes I'm like, you know, I want to listen to something, but it kind of sucks if I can't listen to simulcast, if I have to deal with simulcast. Sometimes I just say I just suck it up and just listen to it. So. Right, right. And you got it twice as bad because you've got the encryption and then also the simulcast. So, you know, you, you kind of really limited on two, on one and the other. But what else are you doing? What other ideas do you have to to try out and and to, to continue troubleshooting your simulcast issues? Okay, this might sound silly because you know I'm still a uh, I'm just, I, I've been scanning for about a year, but I feel like I'm still learning a lot of things. I took an old antenna. <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but I'm, this is how desperate I'm getting. I almost took an old one. I literally tried to saw it in half. I don't think that would help, but I just I want I'm just trying everything I can possible. But yeah, that's just the sense of frustration right there. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, I have. Um, I've tried to, you know, put it in very areas like where, you know, there's a lot of electrical interference, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it still powers through it. I mean, simulcast still powers right through everything. I mean, it, it does feel weird because, you know, back where I live at home, I was able to, you know, sit on my, you know, my kitchen table, do my homework or listen to the police department or go upstairs in my room and listen to it while I'm doing other tasks. But now I kind of have to. 
I have to take about, it's kind of a little bit of a task. I have to do 10 minutes. I have to go to different parts of my room to see what's doing best for me. Mm. Yeah, and being also, that you do, go ahead. Sorry, I was also thinking about putting, I don't know if this will work, I thought about just taking in each individual frequency and just programming it in a conventional. I don't know if that would work. Maybe. I thought about doing that, but I've not gone forward with that yet. Yeah, no, I don't believe that would work for you at all because you got to tell the radio you're in trunk system. What you could try and do, though, is if you want to revisit the Yagi problem, the Yagi solution is I know you're in an apartment, but you know you can find you know a, a pretty small size 800 megahertz Yagi and you know point it in that direction of the transmitter site. This way you point it away from the other one. So that might be something for you to play around with. Even you know something as simple as that could could really help you out as well. There's a lot of plans out there for how to build a three element Yagi or, you know, just something that, you know, the, the more elements you have on a Yagi, the more, the longer it becomes, the more gain you get, but also the more narrow it also becomes uh, as far as beam width goes. So if you had like a two element Yagi, it would be a lot shorter, but you wouldn't have a lot of rejection off the sides in the back. So, you know, it, it's, you do have things you can play around with. Instead of destroying an antenna, you may want to just try and create your own antenna. And, and work that way with it. Just like I said, there's plenty of specs online how to, uh, what do you put in the boom? And, and even if you just use like a piece of, uh, you know, two by four and, or some PVC and some welding rod as your elements, that would be a good start on, on how to do it. And you just uh, solder in the, your coax connector to the, to the main driver. And, you know, that would, that would kind of get you going. Or even I've seen people do with the Wi-Fi, right? They use Pringle cans for uh, their, mm-hmm. their, uh, their Wi-Fi antenna. So, Something like that could be just a nice little project to just get you playing around with something different to try and at least isolate what, what's out there and be, you know, definitely a talking point when somebody comes over your house and it's like, why is there a Pringle can on the, you know, on a stick over there? <laughs> so. I mean, anything, I mean, I'm willing to try anything because I know that a lot of these new scanners are, you know, they're very expensive and mm-hmm. um, I'm debating saving a lot of money for it, you know, waiting till I get out of college to buy that radio or just deal with it and just work around it temporarily for the next few years. Right. I mean, I definitely, definitely understand that. But again, I mean, you have the, the main, the main thing here is you, is you have to isolate, you know, the simulcast. You have to get onto, right. like I said, not the strongest transmitter, but the one that's got the best quality where you are on the best decode knock out everything else that's around it. That's really the best way for you to do it. So even if you buy like a variable attenuator, but you're right between the two sites. So if you attenuate one, you're probably going to attenuate the other one just as equal. So really, like I said, you know, you want to get something in a direction to knock out the other one. Even if you got a Yagi antenna and you pointed it to a site that was, you know, further out because it's now it's, you know, instead of the, the two transmitters being 180, you know, one, one to the east, one to the west of you, for example, Maybe you have one to the north, and then by pointing a Yagi antenna to the, to the site to the north and you're rejecting the two that are closer to you, again, that's something for you to think about as well. So there's there's a lot that you can play around with here when it comes to simulcast and directional antennas. You know, that, that again, that might be something for you to, to try and play around with. And like I said, it's it's not like you want the strongest signal. You just need the best, cleanest signal for you. Right. So it's not as a matter of bringing in so much. It's just rejecting everything else at this point. So, yeah. You know, it's tough. I just thought about this looking at the, I'm on the site of the, our uh, simulcast system. We do have a north and a south. I can listen to the south easily Okay. in some parts of my house. The south, I think, I think the tower is probably 10 miles from here. The only downside to having on the south is it's not active. So example, so north we have Richmond and the Richmond Fire Department, the Police Department, Eastern Kentucky University stuff, and all the uh, EOC operations. And, the um, you know, we have a Army Depot with chemical weapons. They're all on the north system, but they're decompiling. And the only problem is on the south, the only thing I get is operations EMS south and then sheriff, which is actually encrypted. So I tried to work around it by just listening to the south, but I don't get as much traffic on the uh, south as I do the north. Right, and the reason you're not getting that is because the radios in the air that you want to listen to aren't affiliated with those radios in the south side, so there's no reason for those talk groups to be on the south simulcast system. You know, because if your local fire department doesn't ever go into the south end of the county, then it's never going to be transmitted down there. But what I was saying, though, is if you could find a, a transmitter in your simulcast zone that is – you know, in a direction that maybe is a little bit weaker for you, 
that might help you out. And even again, too, maybe if you pointed the Yagi antenna to the south and you try listening to the system you're in, you might just be able to pull it off just enough off the back lobe of the Yagi antenna that it could be attenuated down far enough where, you know, it's just enough to come in. So, because again, rejection is the rule, you know, is, is the rule right. here. So, but it sounds like, though, you're off to a good start as far as, I mean, you definitely got something that works for you, right? SDR sharp, or I'm sorry, SDR trunk, you know is, is working. You know it's a good solution for when you're home, if you're in front of the computer, and you're able to be within hearing a earshot of that right. setup. By going with the online voice over IP PTT app, you're able to then bridge that gap from going remote to being home. So, so that's definitely a very creative way of getting around the portability issues, but you're still going to be, you know, banging your, banging your head against the wall when it comes to walking around <laughs> town with the portable, unless you can get something that's going to, going to work well with the simulcast stuff. So, um, you know, you just get to keep playing around with that one. And I, I hate to tell you it, but you know, little bits and pieces here and there are better than what some other people are getting because there's other systems out yeah. there where it's just not even decoding and you might as well be walking around with a brick in your hand as opposed to a radio because it's just not going to work on the simulcast systems. So, you know, while while you are getting a little bit, you're still getting a lot more than what some other people are getting out there. So you're off to a good start, though, I'll tell you that. And, and again, anybody that's having this issue, same as me, I do recommend doing that. You know, if you don't have the money like I do for, you know, a G5 pay, a Unication G5 or a SDS 100 or 200, just go on ahead and set up SDR trunk and put it on Zello because, I mean, you're going to be limited a little bit. You're not actually have a radio on you, but it works because, you know, for example, as I said before, you know, if, if I'm in an area and my radio is going off because I have audible alerts if you know fire department's dispatch or ems is dispatched and i want to hear that i will i can i hear that alert on my radio when the, the uh, talk group comes in i don't hear anything i can jump right on my phone and listen to it immediately right now there's another website too i just came across as well which we talked about on last the uh, ask scan school session 13 was open megahertz and what they're doing is they have basically unitrunker uh, ties into trunk recorder and then from trunk recorder that records like just the talk groups that are out there and i guess that feeds it into open megahertz so you can kind of isolate just the talk group you wanted to as well by using their platform so you may want to look into that as well it's just open mhz uh, i think dot com and they're still looking for source providers out there as well so they might have some direction for you to go in as well if you just look into like you know scan everything but also isolate out your fire and your ems you can go back and just play back the alert tones you know and find out what the dispatches yeah. are. One of the other big things, and now that you mentioned, I might look this up. Um, part of our, um, you know, Richmond Police Department is encrypted. I did, um, it was a, on the radio reference database, it was a capital E for full encryption. Mm -hmm. I changed it to a lowercase e because on occasion there are some units or dispatch that go unencrypted and it's, it's one of those, it's like it's my lucky day thing, you know, because, <laughs> you know, I don't get to hear that very often. So I, uh, that might be a good idea to be able to isolate that and listen to that. So, you know, you get a little bit of time listening to a usually encrypted system or an encrypted talk group. Right. It makes you kind of wonder, too, if they set up the same way down by you they have up here by me. Whereas, like, the county is encrypted. All the villages, uh, police departments are encrypted. But what happens is if, if the county wants to talk to a village unit, they didn't set up encryption there. So you'll hear, like, PD command come on the air calling a village unit because they have an emergency button pressed on the radio. But you'll never hear anything come back else around again. So it was very interesting to hear that. You know, I still have it labeled as full-time encryption on there because you're not going to hear anything else other than, you know, the occasional. Oh, did you push that button intentionally or not? <laughs> so, um, it's, well, it's not part-time enough for me. Speaking of that, our Eastern Kentucky University, we have a police department. They um, so I don't know if I talked about this on the game with the budget, but as soon as I got you SDR trunk set up, they immediately went encrypted right after that. Oh, unfortunately. Yeah, so, yeah, I know it was the last police department in the county that was clear of encryption. And the only time I've ever heard uh, a, a uh, EKU police department unit was when they were talking to the fire department on their channel for a fire alarm in one of the buildings on campus. That was the one only time I've ever heard them. Wow. So, so close, and they ripped the, they pulled the rug raft from right yeah. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm hoping... I'll just side note really quick. I'm hoping um, – I actually know a guy in our aviation 
crew who um, who works for the volunteer fire department. He said they're bidding on new water roller radios. I'm hoping that doesn't mean encryption. I'm hoping that I mean, he didn't know, but I'm crossing my fingers that they won't do that because the county north of us, Lexington, Kentucky, they are fully locked out. You can't listen to anything except a separate system. At U- U- University of Kentucky's campus, they're a separate system. We can listen to them. Well, I, well, I can't because I'm too far away, but their system is still open. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope the county doesn't go full encryption. Yeah, good good luck with you on that one. It could just be that they want new radios, <laughs> you know, just to phase out some of the old stuff or, or something like that. But, yeah, that's that's tough. But I'm sure you'll find out sooner or later. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately. Well, worse, un- worse comes to worse, I have state police. Right, worse comes to worse. So. Right. And you know what? People say the same thing, with, you know, all the time when it comes to encryption. They all, they all get, you know, I, I understand that, you know, encryption really is – a big a big headache for everybody it, it's you know I, I can see both sides of the situation from both the public safety and the and the uh, the listener but you just have to change the way that you that you go through the hobby right it's and it's exactly what you're doing is you're just adapting to what it is you know you, you're losing this but you're starting to scan something different and like you just said right here well there's still state police and that's exactly what you have to look at it is what else is out there that you can listen to so okay yeah my county went away my county went pd encrypt you know went, went encrypted well what else can I listen to just like you, I got state police. So there is that option there. When state police, if they eventually go encrypted, then, well, then I'll have to find something else to listen to. So there's still other things out there that, that can keep you going and, and keep you in the hobby. And, and maybe you learn to like something else. And yeah, you know, Boohoo P- PD is, is encrypted and something you can listen to. But, you know, if you listen to like, you go over to UK and it's like, you can't listen to anything. I mean, it's just marine and aviation <laughs> on amateur radio. Yeah. So we are still very fortunate when it comes to what you're comparing to with other people, but yeah, it really is. Yeah. It it really is a sore subject with encryption. And unfortunately, you know, from the hobby, we can, we can pout about it all day long, but it's really not going to really make much of a difference. You know, when, when agencies get their mindset on encryption, it's, it's uh, next to impossible to get them to change their mind, to go back the other way, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. And you know, who knows, Maybe with the whole idea with simulcasting issues and, you know, agencies saying, well, you know, we can't really get a d- good decode on the scanner. So there's really no need to go with encryption because simulcast is kind of taking care of that for us. You know, who knows? Maybe that's that's where it goes and that's where it stays. But I, that would be hopeful, but doubtful as well. Right. <laughs> I mean, one, one last thing about the encryption. Um, you know, when, again, when I had the whole, you know, drop the ball or uh, university police, I say, I mean, I know people gripe about it, which I had before. I'm a lie. But, you know, if you're having that trouble, I mean, you can't do anything to change it, as you said. So I would just say, you know, again, as we talked last time, or maybe on a previous podcast with another guest or something, you can just scan, just look around, because you never know what you'll find. Exactly. Yep. Definitely use the search. And in fact, I, I had, I uh, was going for a while too, the frequency of the week, which I was doing on my live sessions on Facebook. I would jump in there and just give a range of frequencies. And I think it was Ken Fowler who actually found out that they were using the UHF TAP frequencies to uh, to stage for a, you know a, um, a hurricane or something like that was coming through, if I remember that correctly. But he never would have been looking in that range, right, if he wasn't into search mode. So, again, there's things right. out there. It may not be what you're used to, but there's definitely other things out there to uh, to listen to. And I'm very right. happy here, though, that you are, you're still plugging away at it. You're still picking it around, that you're still trying to troubleshoot it and that – I think that, you know, by by just keep refining the setup and, and even if you just save a couple dollars here and there per week, you'll eventually figure out either you'll buy new hardware or you'll figure out what the right solution is to, to get your existing hardware working. But like you said too, those those thirty five dollar you know, SDR dongles, those are really a godsend, especially with the software that's out there. So that's always a great affordable option and it's totally worth it to uh, to spend the time working on one of those. Right. All right, Nathan, you have uh, anything else before we uh, we split? No, I think that's it. All right. Well, again, I want to uh, thank you again for spending the time and uh, talking with us today and, and bringing us up to speed as to what it is you're working on and for being our very first, second reappearing guest, which uh, you hold, you know, you now hold that. So <laughs> congratulations on that one. And um, <laughs> if you if you ever make any improvements to the setup or you change anything else around, you know, you uh, – can definitely book again and, and maybe be the uh, the first uh, three peat. So we'd yeah, love to definitely. have you back. I will. We'll definitely come back if I can think of something. 
All right. Thanks again, Nathan. Thank you. So, Nathan, thank you so much again for being a guest again on the podcast. You hold the honor of being the very first person to be here twice. So before we go, I want to thank our Patreon supporters, and they are Dan, Glenn Bryden, James Felling, M.T. Bono, Raymond Hill, Todd Glendai, also Craig Harper, Guy Lee, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Scott Vorder, Signals Everywhere, William Arcand, and our newest Patreon supporter, Jeff Block. Jeff, thank you so much for being our newest Patreon supporter. Now, if you guys haven't heard the bonus episode where I break down what the costs are for the podcast, give that one a listen. It really explains why I use Patreon, why I ask for your support. It does cost a couple hundred dollars a month to keep the podcast going. If you want to help support us, you go to scannerschool.com slash support. You can also give us a one-time PayPal donation as well as helping us at no additional cost by shopping at a couple of online places that we have affiliation set up with. So if you're a big Amazon shopper like I am, you just go to our website, scannerschool.com slash support, then click on the Amazon link. Whatever you purchase from Amazon will help out Scanner School. If you're in the market for a new scanner radio, there's Scanner Master. There's a link for Scanner Master right there. And if you need software, we have a link to Butel's software also on the page. So again, I want to thank everybody who has helped support the podcast. Sorry for the way my voice sounds right now. And I have one favorite ask of you. If you have a question, please submit it to scannerschool.com slash ask. Need your questions early this month. Time is running out. I will not be able to record them at the last minute. So I do need the questions early this month in order to put out a Ask Scanner School session. I've got one question right now ready to go, but I need more. If you leave me a voicemail or a speak pipe, you are in the running to win a free consulting call. So make sure that you do that. This way I can give you a tutorial on how it just makes sense to stick with the school theme here. So again, it will be a tutoring session between me and you instead of consulting calls. So again, if you want your own tutoring call or tutoring session, go to scannerschool.com slash ask and ask your questions. All right. Again, Everything we talked about today can be found on our website, scannerschool.com slash session95. Scanner School is copyright 2019 Monitor Long Island, Inc. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. This is Scanner School. We teach you everything you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73 one.